All right, now that we've set up um, how the pacemaker and cardiac myocyte action potential operate and have a basic under, understanding of reentry circuits and arrhythmias, now we can get to EKGs. Um, all right, uh, I was watching X Men Origins Wolverine clips on YouTube, as one does. Uh, and I realized that X-Men is very unrealistic and it's not because of the adamantium or the super healing. It is that they tried to pass this off as an EKG in the movie. Uh, and hopefully by the end of this, um, this little section, you guys can tell why this is an absolutely ridiculous EKG. That is just laughable how little research they did. Uh, one of the many reasons that movie tanked. Um, all right. So we've talked about this SA node to AV node, the bundle of his, the Purkinje fibers, Fun stuff. Um, all right, when current is moving, so the current's going to move from the SA node here all the way kind of in this direction to the Purkinje fibers. So if I have a lead, like lead two, which is right here, um, as the positive ion, so as the sodium and calcium are coming in, we're kind of kind of have this like positive current moving in this direction. It is going, the lead is going to pick this up and it is going to give us an upward deflection, which is why that goes up and why that goes up and why that goes up. Well, actually, that one's a little bit more complicated, but ignore that. Um, on the other hand, if I looked at something like AVR, AVR lead is over here. Here, the current is traveling away from the AVR lead. So in this case, we should have a downward deflection. We'll see later that AVR and lead two are, have amplitudes really pointing in the opposite direction. Um, also keep in mind that uh, the EKG only picks up myocyte signals. It's the integration of many different signals, some of which are going in different directions, but we're getting the net direction from the myocytes. And that gives us this lovely picture right here. Um, all right, we have 12 leads in total. Um, so six of them are like, kind of like frontal leads and six of them are horizontal leads, also uh, probably more known as precordial leads. Um, uh, so we're kind of going to move clockwise. Um, so one, two, and three, and then we have left, F for foot, and then R for right. Um, the precordial leads now, um, you know, you can see them here, but it's probably a better picture here. The septal leads, one, two, three, four, five, six. So this is going to be on the front of the chest, kind of near the sternum, maybe a little bit under, a little inferior, and then they're just going to move laterally along the chest, uh, in picture here as well. Um, this is maybe a better picture of the precordial leads. And uh, this is what it looks like on a person. Um, and so this moves down in uh, kind, of, kind of logical fashion. So one to two to three. And you're really just making a clockwise twist and a clockwise twist as we go from one to two to three, just continually moving clockwise. And then we're going RLF. So this is in like anti-alphabetical order, um, but it's also moving in clockwise fashion. Uh, clockwise, clockwise, and clockwise. Um, and then one, two, three, four, five, six. Well, that's just an increasing numerical order. These are the precordial leads. And we're going kind of from the medial portion of the sternum uh, a little bit more laterally. Lead two is like the most important one, the most famous one. Again, that is where the current is kind of passing straight to lead two, um, the, the net current. And so that's just the classic one that you see. So that's one of the things wrong with the Wolverine thing is they're just showing one EKG lead when it should really be 12 of them if you want to get a real picture. But often you'll see at the bottom of an EKG just, you know, you, you've got all 12 of them, but then they'll just really highlight two by, by giving it its own space at the bottom. And it's the same as we saw up here, but they're just reiterating because, you know, if you got a quick, hot 10 seconds to glance at an EKG, maybe you just want to look at lead two. If you got more time, you're going to go through all of the leads a little bit more meticulously. Um, and these all have uh, different sections that they're looking at. So uh, 2, 3, and F, these are all um, uh, looking at the, um, the inferior portion. AVL and 1, I think of this 1 as like its own L. These are going to go to the, the left. Um, and now these portions of the, the body, so this is the lateral circumflex artery. Um, and the 2, 3, and AVF, RCA is going to cover the inferior portion of the heart. Um, the uh, 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 anterior descending widowmaker, the LAD, is going to be um, uh, is going to be. Ooh, sorry, it's uh, spacing. Um, 
the LAD is going to be, oh, this makes sense. So this is in the medial portion of the precordial leads one and two. Um, uh, three and four arguably are gonna be in between the LAD and the LCX. And then we also have the five and the six also on the side. Uh, so these are also going to be the lateral circumflex. Um, just uh, another way to think about it. Um, and yeah, there we go. Uh, all right, so when we're looking at this little box, is going to be 40 milliseconds. Um, 40 milliseconds times 5 is one big box, which is going to be 200 milliseconds. 200 milliseconds is just 0.2 seconds. You get five of these big boxes up, um, you have yourself one whole second. Um, and, yeah, we should expect the QRS complex to be about 100 milliseconds, PR interval about 160, QT about 360. And if we counted, you know, this is one, this is two, this is three, and this is four. This is four boxes. Um, that's 0.2 times four. That's 0.8 seconds per beat. If I take 60 and I divide it by 0.8, that's going to give me 75 beats per minute. If I have three boxes, that's going to be 60 divided by 0 0.6, 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0.6. It's going to be 100 beats per minute. Um, and if I have five boxes, this is going to be um, one beat per second, 60 beats per minute. So this is the RR interval. And this is the best way to figure out one, if it's in sinus rhythm, is this a consistent interval? And then two, just is it tachycardia? Is it bradycardia? Um, so we've mentioned these, these, we have mini pacemaker cells with, um, up slanting slopes for phase four, um, for the nodal cells. The SA node is the dominant one. It says the highest rate, 60 to 100. The AV node is going 40 to 60. A bundle of hiss is tied, but we don't care as much about that. Uh, we don't care as much about the uh, left and right bundle branch fibers. Purkinje fibers, we said, are particularly susceptible to electrolyte imbalances. Um, you know, hypokalemia and cocaine and things like this can induce faster rates in the Purkinje fibers, more so. Even though they have a really slow rate, they're so susceptible, it can actually make their rate higher in the SA node, and then they'll be dominant. Um, whenever an electrical signal hits a node, it basically resets, which is why this is the dominant one. Um, and this is ventricles, atria, faster rate as you go up. Um, so notice it resets, 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 resets. Now this is stopped. Now when this goes here, it resets. <laughs> you can watch it again and you guys can just play it back again. This is actually a really great way to understand this. I think this is a, a beautiful uh, gif. Um, all right, normal sinus rhythm. Uh, notice that we just have these smooth, regular intervals. Okay. Um, now let's count the number of boxes. There is one box, two box, three boxes, not quite four boxes, but almost four. Three boxes is 100 beats per minute. Four boxes, 75 beats per minute. So I don't know, this is about 80, 85 beats per minute. Um, normal sinus rhythm, sinus tachycardia, that's fine. Maybe we're exercising, sinus bradycardia, that's fine. Maybe we're sleeping. Um, so these would be the irregular tachycardias that are probably a little bit more important. Atrial flutter, um, atrial fibrillation, ventricular fibrillation, and ventricular tachycardia. AFib, uh, so we would say this is an irregularly irregular heartbeat. So um, it, it's it's not a sinus rhythm, and then the rhythm as well keeps changing. Um, and the um, there's just completely uncoordinated contractions. There's several ectopic foci, several reentry circuits all of which are firing at, at different times and there's just no coordination and electrical signals are crashing into each other and canceling out and we have contractions over here while we also have contractions over there. And at the end of the day, it just kind of looks like this little chaos we see over there. Um, this is the quivering and this is why we don't get any atrial kick. We won't have a P wave um, because it's there, there are contractions, but they're, you know, it'd be like trying to squeeze toothpaste out of your, um, out of the bottle. Um, but like squeezing with your fingers all in random different directions, like maybe a little bit comes out, but not not really. You've got to kind of squeeze in like a smooth, coordinated fashion. Um, we see the same thing with V-fib. Um, atrial flutter, we have an ectopic foci, we have a re-entry circuit, but we just have one dominant one that is setting a regular rate. The rate happens to be above the SA node, which is why this is the dominant. Notice that this is spinning over here, Several times, it does like a couple of loops, maybe two or three loops um, every time that the ventricle uh, passes. And that's, that's the AV node playing defense, is that I can go around a few times before the AV node passes one of those messages along. So we could have an atrial rate of like 300 beats per minute and then a 
uh, ventricular rate of 150 beats per minute, that would be a two to one AV conduction. Maybe it's an atrial rate of 300 beats per minute and a ventricular rate of 100 beats per minute, that would be a 300. So I have one, two, three P waves for every QRS complex. Here I have one, two for every uh, QRS complex, and here would be one, two, three, four for every QRS complex. And whether it's one or the other, just, I don't know, depends on a bunch of random stuff that we don't have to worry about. Um, cool. Wolf Parkinson White, 0.1% of people have this. It is an accessory pathway um, where we can go here. Sometimes it's over here. We basically don't have to go through the SA, SA node. Um, now, this can be bad in and of itself because if we have an atrial tachycardia, then we don't have any defense, any gatekeeper at the, at the AV node, so it can induce a ventricular tachycardia. Um, uh, notice that because we don't have the delay when we go through the bundle of Kent, the accessory pathway, we're gonna initiate ventricular contraction and signals a little bit earlier, which is why we get this QRS that kind of comes up prematurely, right? Normally it goes like this, and now it's going like this, right? It's, it's starting a little bit earlier. That is called a delta wave when it does that. Um, now, one of the problems with this is that not only can we just go through the bundle of Kent, but this is bidirectional. We mentioned this earlier that the signals can move bidirectionally. And so you can actually get a global atrioventricular reentry circuit. Um, and uh, that's no bueno. Uh, so this can lead to a tachycardia. Uh, this is the second most common cause of supraventricular tachycardia. Um, so again, same general idea. Um, a short P interval because the, the delta wave really, um, the pre, you know, the long, elongated QRS. So this can uh, proceed to AVRT, uh, orthodromic, this is anterograde, or it could go uh, retrograde. And the same friggin' picture, but you guys get the, get the idea. Um, all right, AVNRT, so this is nodal. Um, and because it's at the node, we don't really have the node playing defense. I guess it's already sort of past the defense. So the refractory thing that we're looking forward to in the AV node isn't really here. And at the end of the day, so like this is a normal one shown here um, and uh, an abnormal one. This is just, you know, look at this. This is a very short, um, this is, uh, I'm trying to think what the rate would be for this. This is gonna be over like 150 beats per minute, um, as quite quite fast. Um, so it's tachycardia, um, and we have a just nice, regular, reoccurring rhythm, um, and it is, uh, yeah, and that, that is just because, as we see in this lovely picture, um, unlike we had an atrial flutter, every single one of these gets into the ventricles. Um, and of course, no no P wave because uh, you know we're, we're not contracting uh, the the uh, the AV NRT is really calling the shots or the the reentry circuit at the AV node. Um, PVC a premature ventricular contraction. Um, often we just leave these alone; they're not really a big deal. Um, AFib we might say the same thing. It, it's not always a big deal on its own. You know they might progress to worse arrhythmias, uh, and this might progress to VTAC, which is uh, life threatening immediately. Um, and often this is due to enhanced Purkinje automaticity, hypokalemia, um, or ischemia, the hypoxia in induces the, or sort of, in, uh, prevents the sodium potassium pump from working. Cocaine, alcohol, all of these things will have disproportionate effects on the, uh, phase four slope of the Purkinje fibers. Um, so here we have a premature ventricular contract contraction, particularly large. And so if you're counting between normal, you know, here's a normal beat, and that's a normal beat, uh, it's gonna be particularly long. Um, additionally, we have also kind of a long time between this and this, which means that there's a lot of diastolic filling going on during this period, so this should be a particularly large contraction. So we're sort of, we have a premature contraction, we're sort of skipping a beat in some sense, and uh, then we have a large uh, contraction, which is a palpitation that follows. Um, so I guess the way to think about this, um, we have a premature ventricular contraction here. So the ventricles depolarize, but it depends on the timing, but in, in, you know, in the conduction speeds and, and lots of different variables, but if they uh, fire, we get a big premature contraction. And this tries, like, like we talked about, things can go bi-directionally. 
it tries to go up and ignite the atria and cause a depolarization or a, a contraction there. But we have a refractory period. And if the atria are in the refractory period, then uh, it's, it's not going to do anything. Um, now, the atria come out of their refractory period, as they, as they should, and then they initiate just a normal impulse. Um, but that impulse now can't travel down to the ventricles because now the ventricles are in refractory period. Um, and that's why we get this long, 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 long uh, uh, break, basically. So we did not have a, like, this is where we should have had our normal QRS firing, but we didn't have it because the ventricles, as we saw here, were in the refractory period. So we would need to wait another second. Um, so this is a pause, a large pause between normal uh, contractions. This is called a compensatory pause if it's exactly two times the normal sinus inter, uh, interval. Um, and the, the, the longer pause that we said uh, allows more filling, so we have a large uh, contraction here, uh, which is our palpitation. Um, now, a non-compensatory pause is really just starting off the same picture, premature ventricular contraction here. Um, but now it's just the timing is perfect. It moves into the atria and it induces a... Um, uh, uh, doesn't exactly induce a, um, a contraction of the atria, but it travels into the atria and it and effectively resets everything. And so it resets everything. So now we have to go ahead and wait a, um, a whole second. Let's just say that the heartbeat was going at one beat per second. Um, so now in this case, it's, it's 0.88, um, we're counting from this P wave to this P wave, 0.88 and one, this is now two times, or excuse me, less than two times a normal sinus interval. Um, so this is a non-compensatory pause. If it makes you feel better, I don't think the PVC's compens compensation and non-compensation pauses are really high yield. You're responsible for them and you might see them on your EKG test, um, but not, you know, not the worst thing in the world if that doesn't make perfect sense to you. Um, so VTAC can technically be qualified as three premature ventricular contraction, right? Occasionally a pre premature ventricular contraction doesn't mean you have VTAC, but if I have one, two, three in a row, now we say that you're in VTAC. Um, and we mentioned before, enhanced automaticity, um, local reentry circuits, ectopic foci from antiarrhythmic drugs, from cocaine, from alcohol, from hypokalemia, from hypoxia, all sorts of stuff. Um, if we have one dominant ectopic foci or reentry circuit, it's monomorphic. If we have several, so that's going to be kind of like atrial flutter a little bit. Um, if we have several, it's going to be polymorphic. This is a little bit more like fibrillation, but it's not quite fibrillation. It's, you know, it's some kind of in-between thing. I guess if you had enough of these um, where it's so uncoordinated, then it would be uh, in-between. So my, my guess, I'm talking out of my ass here, but I'm guessing we'd have monomorphic, sort of like a fibrillation, or excuse me, a, um, a polymorphic, and then we might have a fibrillation over here. Um, where this is just one foci, this is a few foci, and this is probably so many foci that it's completely uncoordinated. It's a guess. Um, okay, let's, uh, let's keep going. Um, so V-fib, uh, this is uncoordinated contraction. There's too much firing in random directions, and it's just, you know, it's just quivering. It's just quivering. There's no actual um, coordinated contraction, so we don't really get blood out very effectively. And when we look at the EKG, it looks a little bit like we saw with the atrial fibrillation. It's not a very large amplitude, and it's just crazy chaos. Um, and uh, this can evolve in cardiac arrest, um, and it can often evolve from VTAC. Um, so this is also a ventricular tachycardia, but torsade de point, or torsade de, I think it's torsade de point. That's why I say it that way. Um, we're going to have this sort of like sinusoidal nice rhythmic pattern with like how the um how the amplitude changes that's really what distinguishes this so it's a type type of vtac it comes specifically when people have a long phase two or a long phase three really just a long qt interval this can be established by class three antiarrhythmics um, which prevent the potassium uh, influx from the delayed rectifier channels which just elongates that Hypokalemia also, kind of paradoxically, you would expect it to be a large um, influx, but for whatever reason, the, the channels aren't uh, properly activated. Um, also is going to cause a, uh, a, an elongated phase three, which makes people susceptible to, I think this is 
um, the the early after depolarization, um, which, which triggers the torsade de point. Um, and uh, yeah, just, just so you can notice all three of these being a little bit different, large amplitude, wide QRS, ventricular tachycardia. This is one foci. This is several foci. And this is typically a long QT interval caused. And they all just look a little bit different, right? This one does not have the nice, smooth, rhythmic um, sinusoidal waves, right? That doesn't really fit here. It does fit a lot better over here. Um, okay. Uh, hypokalemia um, for the cabillionth time. Actually, let's start with hypokalemia. We've done this one more. Slower phase zero due to the it is depolarized, and if it's depolarized, the sodium channels are not activated as much, hence the flow, slower phase zero of the cardiac myocytes. Um, and, and randomly, it also, it, it super activates the, this is also paradoxical, I, you wouldn't expect the uh, potassium channels to be extra activated, but they are, so we have a, um, uh, a steep phase three, and again, this means that we have a shorter refractory period and this is what we saw. This is what allows reentry circuits to really do their thing is that, um, you know, here's our island of non-conduction. One of these things is going fast, but with fast with long refractory period. That's going to be um, this line here. Um, and then the other one is going to be a slow with short refractory period. And that is going to be this one over here, right? It's slow going up. It's slow at passing the baton on to the next cell, right? That This is what designates how quickly the dominoes fall. But it, it has a very short refractory period shown here. Um, so it can be ignited again. And then it, this allows the reentry circuit to, to occur. So that's hyperkalemia. Hypokalemia is just the exact opposite. So if you look at hypokalemia... And you see that there is this very slow, elongated repolarization phase three. That's this. And because it's slow and weak and long, it's going to be shallow. And here I have a very, very intense um, uh, steep phase three shown uh, here, th this line there. Um, that is going to correspond with a tall peaked T wave. Um, Perchoriditis, often caused by a virus, causes an ST segment elevation. So a lot of this is hypoxia induced. It also causes a PR depression um, and a uh, ST segment uh, elevation. Um, and it's diffuse. So it's in all the leads. This is a big way to distinguish this from myocardial infarction. Myocardial infarction is going to be just, you know, like I'm having the MI on my LAD. Um, so that's only going to affect... Um, you know, maybe like leads like three and four, um, but not, it's not going to affect my, uh, my AVR. It's not going to affect my AVF, right? But the, the pericarditis would elevate all of those ST segments, which we'll talk about right now. So this is normal, not occluded. We have an end STEMI, which is a, um, it's like a more mild heart attack, um, MI, myocardial infarction, um, and, yeah, there's, there's some plaque, maybe there's a clot. Here the clot is just a little bit worse, and so this is a STEMI, it's total occlusion. Um, all right, so what does STEMI even stand for? ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. What does NA stand for? Non-ST segment uh, elevated myocardial infarction. We see this is a depression, and that's an elevation. Um, we also have unstable angina, which uh, also causes this. Unstable angina is really just the same thing as NSTEMI. Maybe it's a little bit less severe, and it does not have um, cardiac biomarkers like troponin. Um, and, you know, there, there's a lot of reasons for why we have the elevation. Uh, my dumb guy way of understanding it is that there's severe hypoxia, and severe hypoxia induces um, a similar effects to what we see with hyperkalemia and um, what we um, just saw with hyperkalemia is that we have a large T wave. So I don't know, uh, they're kind of similar and uh, you know, the, the sodium potassium pump not being fueled affects the potassium gradient, which somehow causes um, uh, over activation of the delayed rectifier channels. I don't know how true that is, but maybe it's a useful fiction. Um, and anyways, most important, and STEMI is the depression, STEMI is the elevation. And uh, we're looking at the inner ventricular septum, the right ventricle and the left ventricle. Here is my epicardium, here is my 
myocardium. Here is my endocardium. Same thing over here, IV, right ventricle, uh, and then the left ventricle muscles, epi, myocardium, endocardium. Um, where does the coronary artery come from again? It comes from right here. It comes from right here, the epicardium. So if I have an end STEMI, and this is not as severe, um, this is perfectly fueled with blood, right? That is where the blood is coming from. So if there's an occlusion, this is going to be the last thing to suffer. It's this area, which is farthest away, which is going to suffer quickly. You might say, wait a second, Will, isn't there a lot of blood in the actual chamber of the heart? Yeah, but remember, diffusion sucks. It can't really get to the middle over there. So this will suffer. That will infarct. Um, now, if you have a STEMI, which is really bad, this is going to be the STEMI where it's a transmural, meaning it affects all of the muscles because it's a really serious infarction. Um, cardiac tamponade often involves from uh, pericarditis if the pleural if, if the pericardial fusions uh, occur really quickly can occur from cancer um, or a you know uh, one to two week myocardial infarction you might have a anterior free wall rupture and then blood leaks in so you got all this blood in the pericardial space and it starts contracting like pushing applying pressure on the ventricles preventing them from fully contracting so we get these weak QRS um, amplitudes, uh, much smaller than normal. Um, like a vigorous QRS amplitude is a, a, a contraction is large and a, you know, a smaller one would be weak. Uh, on top of this, the heart sort of swinging back and forth um, as a, a result of the compression and trying to contract. Um, and so these oscillations in the heart floating back, you know, moving back and forth is going to cause uh, differences in amplitude. Uh, this is called electrical alternons. And... Um, uh, yeah, so, you know, tall, or that's medium, that's taller, and then this is shorter, um, electrical alternates. And heart block, so bradycardia, by, by far less concerning, um, well, not less concerning, but just those many less examples of it. Type 4 antiarrhythmics uh, can, can induce this, as can type 2 antiarrhythmics, which are really just beta blockers, specifically beta 1. We're always talking about beta 1 with the heart. And First degree, we have a long PR period, another long, another long, another long. They're all equally long. That's first degree. So we have some damage to the AV node or the bundle of hiss or something like that. And it just, the delay, which is just the PR segment, is even longer because however long the refractory period was, however slow the conduction velocity is, it's even worse now. It's exacerbated. Um, second degree, I have a PR interval that long and then it gets longer and then it gets longer and then it just completely drops the ball and I don't have a QRS um, signal. It doesn't get past the ventricles. Uh, second degree is really the same thing. Um, you know, I, effectively the same thing. I, I have a, uh, I have a uh, QRS, like we drop the ball in one of them, this, this Mobitz, also known as type 2. The difference is that the PR intervals do not get progressively longer. The PR interval here is the same as the PR interval, PR, PR interval there. So if you drop a QRS randomly um, without a premature ventricular contraction, it's uh, second degree. Now, if the intervals are getting longer, 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 it's type one. Otherwise, it's type two. Third degree is that there's just no connection. I wasn't even trying to make a joke, but they are literally on different wavelengths, um, the atria contracting. So um, the, the rate of atrial contraction has nothing to do. You know, earlier we were doing like 300 atrial contractions for, you know, every one ventricular traction. So, uh, or a, th a, th um, a two to one ratio. So it could be 300 beats and 150 beats. That still is a connection, right? Here I'm, we're saying that there's absolutely no connection. So the uh, PP intervals and the R intervals have absolutely nothing to do with one another. So that is a third degree block.